Uh, welcome to the second uh, seminar of the series uh, Irregular Singularities and Quantum Field Theory. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Anna Barbieri from the University of Sheffield, where he's, she's a postdoc of uh, Tom Bridgeland. Uh, she took a PhD two years ago from the University of Pavia with uh, Jacopo Stoppa. I noticed that both Jacopo and uh, Tom have a uh, ESC grant, so she may think that mathematicians are all very rich, but <laughs> we are not. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and especially for the invitation here to Lisbon. It's, it's really a pleasure. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk is, in, is, in, well, is an introduction to all processing formula and to Riemann Hebert problems uh, from stability conditions. And by stability conditions, I mean regional stability conditions. And uh, so my aim is uh, to describe how some uh, analytical problem, and in particular one analytical problem now, how an analytical problem arise in the study of stability condition which are purely algebra geometric uh, objects. So stability conditions uh, were well the stability conditions I'm, I'm going to, to talk about were introduced by Bridgeland in uh, 2006. Um, and they are a, you know, try to give a mathematical uh, formulation to pi stability uh, studied by Douglas, which is uh, a physics uh, concept. And they are defined for some uh, categories. So I had no idea of, yeah. So you have an analytical proof of problem. Problem. Ah, problem, yeah, sorry. And uh, arises in the theory oh, of. Uh, sorry, it's. It, I tried to to to, to write the uh, bigger. Yeah. Mm. Um, yes. So. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah. I was saying that I have no idea if you have any um, familiarity with the language of categories, and if not, please um, apologize. I will use a bit this language but then I will give also uh, a definition which does not make use of this language. And again, if you're not, uh, if you never heard about stability conditions, this is not an introduction to stability conditions, so I will spend some time uh, saying what I mean by stability condition, but what I usually work with is the space of stability condition, which is a complex manifold. So um, a part of the talk will be about uh, giving an idea of what a stability condition is, and then in the rest of the talk we will talk about the space of stability conditions. So, and uh, yeah, uh, my idea so is, is first to, to say something about stability conditions, and in particular the space of stability conditions, and to do this I will work mainly not with the definition of stability conditions, but with the definition of a BPS structure, which in some good cases is modeled on the definition of a stability condition. So, and then I will introduce the Konsevich and Soberman wall crossing formula. <coughs> and third, I will introduce the Riemann Hilbert problem. And the key point is exactly this uh, Konsevich and Soberman wall crossing formula, because this is the reason why the Riemann Hilbert problems uh, defined by a BPS structure or by a suitable stability conditions, condition makes sense. And uh, the last point, uh, at the end I would like to give an example of how to construct uh, in, a concrete, in a concrete example a BPS structure or a stability condition. Of course, time permitting and my voice permitting. So let me start. Uh, with a sketch definition of uh, uh, stability condition. So a stability condition is defined for a triangulated category D and 
And for simplicity, I assume that this category D has a finite rank rather than D group. Denoted by K of D. I will give an example. I will I will construct the growth in the group for the for the sorry for the example uh, at the end. For now, let's just assume that it is a group with finite rank. Hmm? And the growth in the group in general contains classes of objects of the category. So if D is an object, if D is an object of the category D, I will denote with this symbol its class in the growth in D group. So given, given the a stability condition on D is a pair sigma consisting on A, which technically speaking is a part of a bonded of a bounded structure on D. And in particular, A is an abelian category sitting inside D. And its growth in D group is isomorphic to the growth in D group of, um, of D. And Z is called a central charge or a stability function on the abelian category A. Uh, and this is a homomorphism from the graph in the group in C star. <coughs> and this pair should satisfy some assumption. So it is such that if E, an object of D, is also an object of A, then the central charge of the class E um, belong to a fixed half plane in C star. So this is C star and I have a half plane. Plus some other conditions um, which are the hardener Simon property and the super property, which I won't use, so for now um, I, won't, I won't say what, what they are. <coughs> okay, so this is, uh, this is a, an idea of what a stability condition is, and given a category, we can, given a, such a triangulated category, we also define stab of D, which is the space of all the stability conditions on D, And this is a complex manifold, and it, it is proven that stub B is locally isomorphic to home KB C star through the forgetful map that sends the pair A Z simply in the central charge set. So this is, is a complex manifold. dimension the rank of, uh, of the growth in the group. Okay, so well, once we have the notion of a stability condition, we also need a notion of uh, being stable for objects. And we say that uh, <coughs> if sigma consisting in A and Z is a stability condition on a category D, then an object T in D Um, is sigma semi-stable if uh, T is an object of A and for every sub-object S of T, again this, this is a concept that I will try to explain with the example later, 
Um, then we have that the phase of Z of S is less or equal than the phase of Z of T. And um, so in particular we see that the stability of, of an object depends only on, on, um, on its class in the graph and group. So sometimes uh, I think I think that that it will happen to me that I will say that a class in the graph and group is semi-stable, and by that I mean that all the objects with that class are semi-stable. Okay. <coughs> Good. So we can go there. Last information about this is that in some good cases there exists a theorem counting, beautifully counting semi-stable objects of a given class. When such a theory exists, it's called generalized Donaldson-Thomas uh, theory. And for now there are, well, as far as I know, there are two different ways of encoding the semi-stability into some map. And one is due to Dominic Joyce, and the other is due to Konsiewicz and Soberman. And uh, they, when, when, when they are defining the same examples, they are, they are equivalent. And so I define omega, a map, from KD into the rational number. This is a function of encoding. I don't say anything, just, just to know that in some example there exists such a function encoding the simultaneity of classes in K of D. And the numbers omega of alpha, where alpha is a point here, are called the BPS numbers. They are conjectured to be integers and to agree with the, the BPS spectrum, the, the physical BPS spectrum. But I can't say uh, much more uh, about this. Um, any question? When you say given class, meaning a uh, given uh, class in the graph and the group? In the graph and the group, yes. Exactly. So maybe I can give an example. Um, <coughs> I usually work, uh, work overseas, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, yes, sorry. Um, so, j just an example, and then I will give a working definition uh, of stability conditions. So, suppose that we have two objects, S1 and S2, in the abelian category A, in the triangulated category B. And suppose that these two um, objects have uh, no subobjects. And then we can assume that there exists another object E, which again is in A, such that S2 is the only subobject of E. And moreover, that the class in the graph and the group e is equal, of E is equal to the sum of the two classes S, of S1 and S2. So in order to define a, a, a stability condition, I need to choose a, a heart and then to define a central charge. So for instance, um, I will have that uh, this vector this is the plane C star. This vector denotes 
the central charge of S1, and this vector denotes the central charge of S2. And since Z is a homomorphism, then the central charge of E is here. Okay, so S1 and S2 have no subobject, so whatever central charge we choose, they will be, um, oh, this is a bad chart. They will be semi-stable by definition, because the definition of semi-stability involves only um, the subobjects of a given object. While E has a subobject, and we assume that the only subobject is S2, so in this example, the phase of the subobject is greater than the phase of the object E, so E is not semi-stable. So in this case, S1 and S2 are semi-stable, and E is not. Let's call this, um, this charge Z prime. But we can also give another configuration. For instance, we can assume that Z of S2 is here, and Z of S1 is here, and so Z of E is here. Again, S1 and S2 are semi-stable by definition, and now also E is semi-stable because the phase of S2 is less than the phase of E. And this example, and I've made, I'm doing this example because I want to describe uh, a um, particular structure which is on the space of stability condition, which is the wall and chamber structure. So suppose that this is a, the complex manifold sub of E, then this is divided into some chambers, like this. And you see that since, since the, stabi the stability of an object depends only, in this case, in, if you have these three objects, the semi stability of the objects depends only on the relative position of Z of S1 and Z of S2. So I can move a little this vector or this vector, and the semi stability, I will obtain another, another central charge and another stability condition, but the stability of all the objects that I'm considering won't change. So in each chamber, each chamber is defined in such a way that the very same objects are semi-stable with respect to the stability condition in that, in that chamber. So for instance, here we have A, that time. Of course, this configuration belongs to a different chamber because there are other objects which are semi-stable. <coughs> okay, and again, also here I can move slightly the, these vectors, Z of S1 and Z of S2, and they will have different stability conditions, but with the very same semi-stable object. So these are called chambers, and here I have some points which uh, correspond to a limiting configuration, and the limit, limiting configuration is when the central charge of S1 and S2 are aligned. So this is this configuration means that Z of S1 is lambda Z of S2. So this configuration corresponds to a subspace of real two-dimension one in the space of stability condition. And this is called a wall. It's a real two-dimension one um, sub subspace. So, in each chamber, if we have such a theory, this, the, the BPS map will be constant. But of course, the BPS map will change um, if I consider this map as a map depending on a central, well, on a stability condition, will change when I cross a wall. And the wall crossing formula by Konsevich and Solberman tell us that if we know the BPS map in a one chamber, we are also able to recover the BPS chamber, the BPS uh, map in, in a contiguous chamber. So this is the result by Konsevich and Solberman. BPS numbers on a chamber 
H1 determine the BPS numbers on H number H2 with a common boundary. And determine through the so called water output formula. But in order to do this, I need more notation. And that's, so now I, I and for, the, for, for having this more notation, I prefer to work with uh, this new definition that I'm going to give, which is the definition of a BPS structure. A BPS structure, I was saying at the beginning, is modeled on the definition of a stability condition on uh, a triangulated category in the case that that triangulated category has another um, property, which that is, it is trickle up out. And moreover, we need that there exists a well defined theory of those invariants, those BPS numbers. So we need more hypotheses in, or, in order to, to say that a stability condition define a, a BPS structure. But Ooh, why do you say BPS numbers and not number? Uh, a single one. Because the, the map your map was had values in Q. Uh, ah yeah numbers? yeah it's numbers just to say that to each uh, the number associated to each class. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, so a BPS structure is a triple gamma Z Omega consisting on a lattice gamma of finite length n endowed with a skew symmetric, an integral skew symmetric and linear pairing Z is a homomorphism from gamma to C star, and we call it a central charge. And omega is a map of set from gamma in Z. We assume that these numbers are integers, um, such that omega, which is symmetric, in the sense that omega alpha is equal to omega of minus alpha. And uh, satisfying um, some other conditions. Again, I, I don't I, I don't explain this condition, which are the support property and a convergence hypothesis. So notice that if you remember, I said that the central charge map all the objects of a given heart in the same half plane. While well, here, I'm saying that these numbers encoding the stability uh, of, you know, of objects are symmetric. So I'm taking also these, uh, these maps, uh, the, these objects minus alpha. And the reason for that is that here, I'm, cons I'm really considering all the, the stability conditions on the triangulated category. And we have this fact, which if T is an object of D, and it is semi-stable, uh, with respect to some condition sigma a z, then there exists also another object uh, again in, in D, which is T1, which is semi-stable with respect to another stability condition denoted in this way, shift of the heart and same central charge. So this is this is just a note. If it doesn't make sense to you, just forget it. But I wanted to explain why I have this, um, this property. <coughs> okay, 
And of course, also in this case, I will give the same, the, the same definition of uh, semi-stability. Um, okay, so... It, make a, it, it makes sense that this is modeled on, uh, on a stability condition because... Oh, I erased it. Because locally, the space of stability condition was uh, the home of some group in two C stars. But, but in this case, it would be a function. Yeah, we... It doesn't, yes, there are, some, there are some assumptions. Yes, exactly. So now I introduce the concept and solver one uh, Lie algebra. Um, this is just the algebra of formal elements laid by uh, points in the lattice over C <coughs> with, with a commutative multiplication x alpha x theta equal to minus 1 uh, pairing up to beta x alpha plus beta and there is also a new bracket and, and I'm sorry, what is the intuition for omega for this omega? Um, they should be the same as the VPS numbers and we call it the VPS spectrum. And they also should agree with the, BPS, the physical VPS spectrum, which um, I, I don't know. Uh, but yes. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, so here it was really saying that these, these, these numbers, this map, should encode the, semi, the stability of uh, the classes of my, um, of my group, of my lattice. <coughs> so I have this, uh, this algebra. I also introduced this notation by L alpha. I mean a ray emanating from the origin in the complex plane in the direction of the central charge of an element alpha. And uh, if omega alpha is non-zero, we call L alpha an active ray. And also we call in the, um, alpha an active point. And then I have the we have the conservative and solver monotomorphism. which are attached to some rays in the complex plane. So S L is an isomorphism of the algebra for L a ray from the emanating from the origin in uh, in, in C star. And that they are defined in this way S L acting on a point X beta is equal to X beta times the product over all the points alpha such that z of alpha is in that ray of 1 minus x alpha to the omega alpha pairing alpha beta. Um, okay, so these, these are automorphism of this infinite dimensional uh, uh, algebra. We have a commutative multiplication here but this does not mean that these automorphisms commute, and it's quite easy to see that they, in general, they don't commute because every time that I apply this automorphism, I have this, this uh, pairing uh, here. Uh, but we usually assume, we usually make a genericity assumption, so we assume that every time that two points, alpha and alpha prime, have z of alpha and alpha prime in, on the same ray, then the pairing alpha alpha prime is equal to zero. So this product is, is well defined in the sense that I don't have to specify an order uh, for, 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 for this product when I, when I consider one ray. The prime means the only active ones? Uh, sorry, say the, the prime there, the omega alpha prime dash. The omega? The, the formula for Ah, uh, no, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
Good. Okay, so finally the wall crossing formula by Kucevich and Soiberman. So this only is different from the one uh, on the uh, discrete set of um, in in the geometric ex examples, uh, usually not, but but we can assume that it's different from zero. Uh, yes, we can assume that there is uh, yes, there is at least um, yeah. Okay, we can we can as we should assume that there are finitely many active rays, which is the first assumption that we should do in order for the rest to make sense, and. Uh, uh, we can either assume that there are finitely many um, alpha for which omega alpha is non-zero, or we can absorb this into a convergence property. But but in the in the examples that, that in the example that I will I will give at the end, we will have a finite number. So let's let's just assume that there are finitely many. Thank you. <coughs> okay. So the formula is that. For every convex, strictly convex sector, delta in C star, the BPS spectrum is defined in such a way that the order product over all the rays contained in my uh, uh, convex sector, this means order product of the, the KS automorphism SL is constant as long as no active rays Cross the boundary uh, of that sector. Um, so, an example. I will use the very same example as before. Suppose that. Gamma is a ramp two lattice generated by two points, S1 and S2. And they have, and it has a standard pairing defined by S1, S2 pairing equal to 1. Then we can define two BPS structures according to the pictures, to the two pictures that I was presenting before. Um, here we have gamma z prime omega prime, um, where I say that. Uh, this is Z prime of S1, this is Z prime of S2, and um, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking uh, the rays, so this is L1 and this is L2. Because of the symmetry of omega, I will also have minus L1 and minus L2 corresponding to the direction uh, Z of minus S1, that is minus Z of S1. And um, in this case, we assume that omega prime of S1 is equal to omega prime of S2, which is equal to 1, and omega prime is equal to 0 um, other way. So this is, this is based on, on the first configuration where we had these two semi-stable objects. And of course, we have many other rays. In particular, we had the ray LE uh, associated with the direction of Z of E 
in the in the previous I think the previous previous example. Okay, and uh, okay, the other configuration was um, can correspond to this. Uh, now we have that here we have L1, let's call it second and it's prime, prime, prime. This is in the direction of Z second of S1. Here we have L second with 2 in the direction of Z second of S2, the opposite rays, and also a ray L second of E, and minus L second of E. So, to each ray in the complex plane, we associate the automorphism of this type. Of course, it makes sense to consider such an automorphism only when the BPS spectrum is non-zero on, uh, on, the, on the points uh, with central charge on that ray. So, in this case, we will consider these automorphism associated with L1, L2, uh, L1 prime, L2 prime, and their opposite rays. And such an, uh, so here we have S L1 prime. This is an automorphism of the conservative and Solomon algebra. I need to know what it does on the generators. So it sends X1 in X1 because the pairing S1, S1 is equal to zero. But the pairing S1, S2 is equal to one by hypothesis. So here it acts non trivially and it sends X2 in x2 times 1 minus x1, sorry, xi correspond to x uh, si, of course. And then I have um, omega s1 and the pairing s1, s2, which is equal to 1. Okay? And again, here for l2, I have an automorphism at l2 prime, sending x1, now it acts non trivially on x1, so this is x1 times 1 minus x2 uh, omega uh, s2, and the pairing um, s2, s1 is equal to minus 1, so minus, but it is trivial on x2. So these are the type of um, automorphism that we have. I can erase this now. And this, the, the similar automorphisms, of course, are associated uh, to, to these rays with a different uh, central charge. So we had, here we had these two active rays. Again, this must be active, and I anticipate that this will have non-zero uh, BPS, uh, uh, BPS uh, spectrum, because it was, uh, it was active. And the conservation of the wrong word process formula is just telling us that given a convex uh, factor, let's take the same here and here, the order product of the automorphism associated with the rays is the same. So let's go, for instance, uh, uh, counterclockwise. Uh, we have that uh, S L1 prime composed with S L2 prime. This, on that configuration, must be equal to S L2 second composed with S L E second composed with S L1 second. <coughs> And uh, the datum of the BPS spectrum is encoded in the fact that uh, we had this uh, power here. So these numbers appear as uh, exponents of, uh, um, of, the, of the automorphisms. One way to solve this, uh, this sort of formula, this sort of equation, is to work uh, formally in these, uh, in these formal variables and to portion every time by some uh, some power, so it's a recursive uh, 
way of solving. So this is this is the conservation solvent wall crossing formula, and this was just was just an example. So what do you mean by active? Sorry. Uh, by active, I mean that the BPS spectrum is non-zero, just because, of course, also here we have um, the BPS. Uh, so, sorry, also we have also here this ray, but the automorphism uh, is trivial because uh, because omega is equal to zero in. Uh, in this case. And uh, yes, so as long as no active ray cross the boundary mean that, means that if, if, I, if I move the central charge in such a way that this ray uh, goes out of this, um, of this sector, I can't, I can't put an equality between, um, uh, between uh, the two uh, products uh, in the two configurations. <coughs> Okay, so um, now the point is that, um, so again, thanks for the comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah what is called the scattering diagram, is this thing that you from two lines you produce these three lines? Um, yeah, we can, we can uh, okay, here I, I'm not using any scattering diagram, but Yes, this is the same as the Pentagon, I think it's called this, this example, the Pentagon scattering diagram, where, because if we, uh, so here we have uh, L1, so, sorry. Um, okay, we can rephrase this, this equation saying that uh, um, X, L2 to the minus 1 at L prime second at L e at L2 at L1 to the minus 1 is equal to 1. So if I use this exponent to give the direction and I keep fix this ray, um, I have two rays, minus uh, L1 and minus L2. Let's say this, and then I have L1, L2, and in the previous example, I said that L e is uh, the class of E is, is the sum of the class of S1 and S2. So here I have this, this, and this. This is a scattering diagram, and the consistency um, formula for a scattering diagram is that the product of some automorphism, sorry, sorry the order product of some automorphism associated with, the, with these rays is equal to one. So it is equivalent in, in this sense. But, but this picture, uh, yes, is slightly different from, from this. Thank you. Uh, any other question? No? Okay. Um, what can I do this? Well, let, let me just do it for a moment. So, so now, um, yeah. So, so this example, you 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 had all the information about the BPS spectrum. But suppose I give you, I give you the BPS spectrum in one chamber on yes. one side of the wall. Yes. How easy is it in practice to extract information about the BPS spectrum on the other side? Of the wall? I think it's not it's not easy because, well, we always know that. Those, those objects without subobject have a non-zero BPS spectrum, and let's say that this is also always equal to one. So if I want to solve this equation, here I will have a product of this type, um, and suppose that we know the, the omega on this side. Now here I will have another product. I, I know the omega for this, for this um, ray, and I know the omega for this ray because I was assuming that uh, they have no subobjects. Well, putting together the various examples that that I that I gave, or assuming this, and here I could have an arbitrary number of automorphism associated with an arbitrary number of um, of rays here in this uh, between L1 and L2, and a way for um, for knowing which rays are here and what are their 
BPS numbers is, is, as I was trying to say, is to work formally. So I write down, I expand this product, and I expand this product. And then, of course, this is a huge product, but I, I can quotient every time by some powers. So I can first look at uh, degree one, I can, uh, the, um, at all the parts involving degree one variables, and I deduce what should be the omega of, according to that. And then I can consider all degree two variables, and then again I can compare with, uh, I can compare the quotient of the two, of the two expression, and so on. But but there are some geometric examples where you really have infinitely many uh, rays. So, but in in those cases, I yeah, I don't know. So and, and it's also really not trivial to say. To, to prove that in some cases those numbers really are integers because a priori for, for the first definition that I gave, they should be um, rational numbers. But um, yeah, I, 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 I tried once <laughs> to be honest <laughs> to do this computation just to, to prove myself that you can do something, but that, that was the only time <laughs> that, that I did that. Okay, uh, so another comment about this formula is that a formula like this is exactly the same as a formula for, as is exactly what, well, is very similar to the isomonodromic condition for a system of differential equations with uh, a pole of order two. So the fact that we have this formula uh, makes natural now to associate to a BPS um, structure a riemann hebel problem, or better saying, to interpret this pair consisting on a ray and on a, a automorphism as the Stokes data uh, which, um, which define the monodromy of some differential equation. So should I say something about Stokes data? Or Yes, OK. Um, so if we have a differential equation of this type, where u and v are in some algebra, and supposing GLN, and u is diagonal, and the is Q symmetric, a very nice, uh, very good example is this, then there is a way of defining the monodromy of this equation. So the monodromy will, will tell us how the solutions uh, uh, behave around the pole of order two, which here is the origin, and the generalized monodromy In this case, is encoded in the Stokes data. Which are a finite, uh, um, set, a finite set of pairs, L, S, L. Where L is a ray from the origin in the direction of the eigenvalue of u, and uh, SL is a automorphism in the GLN. So we have that given uh, if x, this is lambda, if x is a solution to this equation, uh, then uh, there are some, uh, the plane, the complex plane where t lives is divided into sectors. Uh, defined defined by by u, and um, this this function here is a piecewise uh, continuous function. It is continuous in every sector. It has a given prescribed behavior um, around the origin, and it has a discontinuity uh, along these rays, which are called the Stokes rays, 
and the discontinuity is prescribed prescribed by the um, uh, by these Stokes factors. It, it is a generalization of the case of equal of order one, uh, because uh, because we can extend actually in this case we can the solution here can be extended to a half plane, and then we can compare different solutions where for a pole of order one, it could, a solution could be extended to, to, to the whole uh, complex plane minus a ray. And then the, the, the usual monodromy that we know tell us how, uh, what happened after we, we, we go along a loop, essentially. Okay, so this is, this is um, the stock data associated with such a, um, such a differential equation. I used to I used to consider I used to uh, I usually talk about connections on a trivial bundle. So if in the following I will uh, I will say connection on a trivial bundle, I mean a differential equation. Okay, that's that's fine. And um, a Riemann Ebel problem usually uh, consists. Um, I can't use that. Um, classically, it consists in finding a function, a piecewise holomorphic function, at uh, from C into some <coughs> manifold uh, with describe discontinuities along uh, real to dimension one boundaries. So we can impose a riemann hebrew problem where the boundaries are rays emanating from the origin and um, with value in uh, some space. And this Riemann-Hilbert problem is associated with uh, the theory of differential equation of this type, exactly because a solution to such an equation uh, behaves in that way. So uh, there are Riemann-Hilbert problems associated This type of uh, in that case, I should also prescribe a behavior at the origin. But the point is that um, we have we have this again, assuming finite number of uh, rays in our picture uh, defined by the BPS structure. We have this uh, number of rays, and to each ray, we have a associated a automorphism. Of some uh, of some algebra, and so we can define a riemann hebel problem consisting in finding a piecewise holomorphic function uh, in the sectors um, bounded by the active rays of a BPS structure, and with uh, discontinuities prescribed by the Konsevich and Solomon automorphism. And this problem that can be, can appear as totally arbitrary because. Actually, what we had, we had just a BPS structure, and we could define uh, in any <laughs> in any possible way a bunch of rays and of automorphism. But that problem is natural, and it makes sense exactly for the conservative and Solomon wall crossing formula, because that formula is the analogous of the isomonodromic condition for connections of of this type. So, this is the analytical problem that. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to, to introduce.
you were saying, that a Riemann Hebrew problem? Yes, okay. Um, I probably don't give the example that uh, I was planning to give about uh, the construction of, of a stability condition. I, I will finish in just here. Um, so these, these data give this, um, give this Riemann Hebrew problem. And uh, we can uh, try to solve this uh, wave value in uh, the conceptual of Sobermann uh, Lie algebra. This is an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, yes, but uh, there are some uh, ways to make, to turn this problem into, uh, well, in some cases, even a problem with value in, uh, just in the complex numbers or in an algebraic torus. And um, the point, well, from my point of view, for what I, for what I know, the main point of solving such a riemann hebert problem is to associate to some open subset of the space of stability conditions, which is, uh, uh, which has that uh, wall and chamber structure, a family of meromorphic connections on a trivial bundle over CP1 of that type. And this, and such a family of isomonodromic connection um, is is important, for instance, in the theory of Frobenius manifolds or Frobenius-like uh, structures, because the space of parameters of, of that type of connections is endowed with some extra structures. So one goal, for instance, is to use, to solve this problem, to pull back the structure that we had on the, on the parameter space of, um, of a family of connection on the space of stability conditions locally and then with, with other uh, problems. And I will finish just saying a, a few words about uh, who consider this kind of problems. So these type of problems were considered uh, in the mathematical literature uh, with value in uh, C gamma plus other assumptions by Filippini, Garcia Fernandez, and Stoppa in 2013. Um, the setup was not exactly the same, but uh, very similar. And then they were reconsidered in 2016 by Bridgerand um, in a setup more similar to this, but with very strictly conditions in a very specific ex example. Then I also consider this kind of problem, generalizing the construction by Tom Bridgerand. And another approach, and, and in, uh, in, the, in those works, we don't work with this formal algebra, but we work on a complex torus. And there is also another approach by Bridgerand and Allegretti, consisting in uh, using, some, using some theory from um, cluster varieties uh, to, to give a solution to, to, to this type uh, of, uh, of problem. And yeah, I think it's better to stop here. And if you want, I can, I can give the example <laughs> later, maybe. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Yeah, so in this formulation, in terms of connections, yes. of connections what is the concrete mind that you get out of it? The concrete? The mind that you get out of it. So, sorry. Yeah. What you get out of it, in addition to what Conservative Sodom Sutherland knew already? Um, to when, me... When, when you do this reformulation yeah. in terms of Prima Hilbert and connections yes. and that, what exactly are you aiming at? Yeah, uh, my goal for me is to is to take the space of stability condition yes. that is a complex manifold yes. and to endow it with more structure. Oh. And we would like that this structure carry some enumerative uh, information. Yes. Carry some enumerative information. So for instance, in, a, in the theory of Gromovitian invariance, which is somehow parallel to the theory of uh, the, B, the BPS uh, invariance, we have um, we can, uh, uh, Dubrovin used these, uh, these Gromovitian invariants uh, to, to define this Frobenius structure. And he also proved that uh, um, 
locally um, the space of uh, parameters of a family of isomonodromic connections uh, of this type um, it has this Frobenius manifold structure. So if we want to, to study this sort of parallelism between the two theories, we may wonder whether the space of stability conditions as a complex uh, manifold carries some structure which is similar to the Frobenius uh, manifold structure, which is defined by the gram of eating invariance. And uh, so this is, this is one, of, uh, one of the goals. Another goal that um, um, people have is um, there is a definition of um, cluster varieties. This is a definition which has some topological reason, as far as I know. But um, cluster varieties are defined by gluing some tori. And the way this tori glue is um, very similar to the formulas for the Konsevich and Solvin automorphism. So their goal, for instance, is, is to show that there exists a well-defined map from the space of stability condition in this, uh, in this cluster variety, and then to extract some other information for, for, from this. But uh, yeah, so, so the point is really to study just the space of stability condition, not, not to compute, for me, not to compute the BPS spectrum. But, but it might be that that we, you can do something more, or that, I don't know, or something. But sorry, so can you turn it around? Like, so if you know the spaces to stability conditions, uh, can you state something about the goal of the two No. No, that was just an analogy, okay, in, order, in case you, you did know something about this. Yes? Uh, could you say some words about the example? Yes. So I wanted to, it might require 10 minutes if I explain it, uh, everything. So, but I can also just say what I was planning to say, if you prefer. So, so your example was to compute uh, the, the connection associated no, with no, the No, 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 I wanted the, um, I wanted just to show um, explicitly what a BPS structure is. So I wanted to consider a, so this is a quiver A2. So I wanted to show uh, that there is a triangulated category associated to A2, and that there is also a abelian category associated with this quiver. And this is the category of representation of this quiver. And then I wanted uh, then to compute the Grothendieck group, to define the Grothendieck group using this example, and to show how um, we define a BPS uh, structure from, uh, from a concrete example, so starting from an abelian category. I would um, love to see that. OK. <laughs> <laughs> No, so okay. what is the group in this case? Um, so, what, what is rep of A2? This is fine? Uh, yes. You can use it. We are not in the Okay, so, um, well, super briefly, a quiver is an oriented graph, mm -hmm. and I assume it to be acyclic uh, for, for simplicity. This is one basic uh, example of a quiver. And to this, we can uh, associate a triangulated category. I don't say anything about this, uh, which also satisfies this three Calabi-Yau property. Okay? It's usually denoted by D3 of, uh, of the quiver. And there is, a, there is also this standard abelian category associated with a quiver, which is the category of representation of the quiver. And this is the heart of a bounded C structure for this triangulated category. So what are the objects of this uh, category? The objects are sequences of vector spaces um, uh, associated with the vertices of the quiver and with a morphism 
and with morphism associated with the with the arrows. So here n1, and then two are greater or equal than zero. I'm working. Uh, you can you can you can change the field, of course. And f is a homomorphism from c n1 to c n2. And the morphisms in this category are um, are a, um, a set of morphism between the vector spaces of this uh, representation. So if we have two if we have two objects, say F sorry, E1, uh, no, yeah. S C and one F C and two and here C C M one G C M two a morphism from S to T is this set of morphisms, P1 and P2, in such a way that this diagram um, commutes. <coughs> Sorry. And um, we, the notion of subobjects here is that we say that two objects are isomorphic if I have a morphism from S to T, well, S and T are isomorphic if I have a morphism from S to T, and S is a subobject of T, if I, sorry, are isomorphic if I have one morphism and also another morphism in the other direction. And otherwise, in this case, I would say that S is, is, is a subobject of T because there is a map, <coughs> a map from, S, from S to T. Okay, so this is an abelian category. This is a billion, and also is the standard part for this uh, uh, triangulated category D3 of A2. For the construction of this category, um, um, so for, for the construction of this category, the abelian category, we, we take the path algebra of this quiver and uh, of, or of a quiver, and in general for constructing the triangulated category given any quiver, we modify the quiver and then we construct the path algebra and we, this, is a, this is done by Keller and Young, uh, was done by Keller and Young, I think. Okay, so uh, what I need it, uh, to define, um, yes, the Grothendieck group, K of A, and then we had, this was isomorphic to K of T. This is uh, obtained, um, we first consider this, the space generated by um, isomorphism classes of objects in A. And we quotient it by this relation, class of A plus class of C is equal to class of B if we have a short exact sequence involving the objects A, B, and C. So we, we make this, um, we consider this quotient, and um, this, this set with, the, with this operation can be, uh, so an object in here, now I take the class of A, can be mapped in the dimension vector, in the dimensions vector. Which is, if A is, sorry, this is A, its dimension vector is N1, N2. Okay, and then we obtain the Grotten D group by taking the formal inverse, so by making this into, into a group. Here, of course, we have that N1 and 2 are greater or equal than 0. And so, uh, and we obtain this Grotendieck group K of A. This is isomorphic to K, sorry, 
sorry, by A, I mean this. And this is just D3. This is isomorphic to K of D3. And uh, the inverse of an element of a class in uh, here has, an, has another meaning because on its triangulated category we have the operation of shift. So a class minus, uh, minus the class of T will, uh, will consist of objects uh, which are the objects of the class of T shifted by an integer, sorry, well, uh, with the operation of shift shifting. But uh, in any case, we have this automorphism. So in this case, so in the case of categories attached to a quiver, since we, I'm assuming that the quiver is finite, I have that K of A is isomorphic to the lattice. Uh, let's say that the quiver is the vacuum of its vertices and the arrows. So the Grothendi group is uh, Z to Q0, where Q0 is the number of, um, of vertices. Um, so if we start with this example, we can define a stability condition on this category D3, just taking as a heart, the standard heart, which is this one study category, the representation of the quiver, and then taking a, a central charge, a homomorphism, defined by this finite rank lattice into the complex numbers, into the non-zero complex numbers. So uh, we can define sigma a z with z a homomorphism from, let's call it gamma, as in the language of the BPS structure, from gamma to C star, plus the condition that z of um, Mm. Well, well the, the point is that I, I was saying that I should objects of A should go in the same half plane, and we take the up and this this half plane is the upper half plane. So in uh, in C star. So in this example, we really have two simple objects which have no subobjects, and there are, and they are the objects uh, which have um, one dimensional space associated with one vertex and zero dimensional uh, spaces uh, on the other vertices. So this object S one is C zero, and S two is zero. They define, uh, their classes define a basis for the Grothendieck group, of course, and the pairing is the pairing that we have uh, that we have seen. Um, okay, so I, def I can introduce also this other object, E lambda, whose uh, dimensions vector is one one. So here I have to prescribe a morphism. And the morphism that I can define from C to C is a multiplication. So assume that lambda is non-zero. And it's quite easy to see that for every lambda which is non-zero, all these objects are isomorphic. Because um, we, well, just changing the basis, of course. And we have in this case that S2 is a subobject of E lambda for every lambda because <clears throat> if I take S2 um, and I take uh, E, I want uh, to, sorry, I didn't say, to define a, to say that it is a subobject, I ob obviously mean a morphism which is non zero. So here I have zero, here I have lambda, uh, here I just have the inclusion, which is the map zero, here I take lambda. And this is a commutative diagram. So S2 is a subobject of E lambda for every lambda. S1 is not, because if I take this, and I want this is E lambda 
and S1, and I want to define the amorphism. Here, I, I should, the only morphism that I can define is the multiplication by zero. Here I have lambda. This can be nothing else by zero, or the inclusion of zero into C. And the only way that I have to make this diagram commutative is that this morphism is zero. So this is the zero morphism. It's not an interesting morphism. So S1 is not a subobject of E lambda. And I have an extra object, which is E0. Um, C C with the zero map. I can see this as um, this. Well, this is really the same. They are isomorphic. It's clear. And this is the direct sum of S1 plus S2. So, so both S1 and S2 are subobject of this um, uh, of this object. So from this, we deduce that there, is, there exists a short exact sequence, um, S2, E lambda, S1. <coughs> Here, we for also for E0, we have a short exact sequence of this type. Actually, in this case, we will also have the other exact sequence. But the point is that both E0 and E lambda, for every lambda non-zero, define the same class in the Grothendieck group, which is why the Grothendieck group uh, is isomorphic to the dimensions vector. So we have, we have um, yes, we have exactly uh, the basis for defining all the examples that we, we have seen during the talk, because uh, I have a finite rank Grothendieck group, I have two uh, simple subjects with no subobjects. For every central charge that I find, they will be semi-stable. And I have an object uh, E for its class was, uh, yes, here, whose class is the sum of the class of S1 and of S2, and it has as a subobject S2, but not S1. So um, if I consider the space of stability condition, that of P3, there will be a portion of this space which consists on condition supported on this standard heart. Of course, I can change the heart, but we don't go into that, those details. So here I will have all these uh, conditions supported, supported on uh, this heart, where, sorry, the heart is Z of A2, and Z is an arbitrary central charge. And uh, this portion, so forget about this for a moment. And this portion is divided into two chambers corresponding to the stability conditions making S1, S2, and E semi-stable, and the stability conditions making uh, just S1 and S2 uh, semi-stable and not E. And of course, the, the very same picture can be, can be done also for any other quiver and we will have some more complicated uh, examples, more, more, si more simple points to, to consider in order to just to see what, what happens for... So what are the BPS numbers in this case? The BPS numbers in this case are, are here, omega S1, omega S2 equal to 1, and here, omega S1, omega S2, and I think also omega E equal to 1. Uh, I should, I should uh, check, but uh, uh, yeah, this, this thing. And zero otherwise. And uh, there, are, there is also another theory, the theory of DT invariant, that, uh, so it, it's clear that if here I take uh, um, a multiple of this class, um, this, the subobjects will be related, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So also some other points will be semi-stable. And uh, usually the invariants taking into account also these uh, these multiples are denoted by dt. Just just in case you see both the notation in the papers. And, and but there is a relation. There is an equation uh, involved in the two. Yeah, so this, this was the example that I wanted to, to present. Thank you. Okay, I'm